Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Gary. For those of you who are at any of our earlier sessions, welcome and thank you for coming to Cisco's sponsored room uh, for the afternoon for our first of two afternoon sessions. Uh, got a great panel lined up for you today. Um, I'm going to do just some very, very quick first name introductions. I'll let the panelists each introduce themselves in a little bit more detail before they dive in. Um, also, just want to remind everybody that the little card that we handed out to you as you came in, please fill that out. We will be doing a drawing at the end of today's session for an Apple Watch. Cisco people, be careful about filling out your cards. Um, and with that, I'm going to do some very, very quick across the stage introductions. Our moderator today, Dwayne, panelists Lou, Uri, Daryl, and JL. And with that, gentlemen, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Well, good afternoon, and welcome to a panel discussion on real-world solutions for network function virtualization, or NFE. I'm Dwayne DeCaput, Director of Product Management for OpenStack and Cisco's Cloud and Virtualization Group, and we're excited to be hosting this panel today. We know that NFE is top of mind with virtually all service providers. A recent survey by Infinetics indicates that 93% of all service providers have either started to deploy NFE or want to deploy it in the next 12 months. So we know that NFE is on everybody's mind. And in this panel today, this is everyone's panel. I mean, we're going to ask the tough questions. What are the barriers to adoption of NFE? And then we're going to open it up to questions um, for Q&A at the end. So Cisco, on behalf of Cisco and our good friends with um, Intel and Red Hat, we're excited to be hosting this panel today. Cisco is dedicated to OpenStack. We've been involved uh, in the OpenStack Foundation since its inception. Our cloud CTO and vice president, Lou Tucker, is also vice chair of the OpenStack Foundation. We're a top five uh, member company in terms of number of memberships and essentially have been involved since the beginning of the OpenStack Foundation. So um, who here has been to more than one OpenStack Summit prior to today? All right, what about more than three? What about more than five? Well, awesome. So this is my sixth. You don't count, Ken. So this is my sixth. Lou and team has basically been there since the beginning, and we've been contributing code across all the major services. Nova for compute, Horizon the dashboard, the drag and drop GUI curvature for Liberty, that's from Cisco. I've done a lot of investment in Neutron, and now we're expanding beyond Neutron, um, working with a lot of components based on um, containers. Cola, OpenStack services in container, as well as Magnum, networking uh, containers and applications on containers. We're all, we've also made a large investment in engineering for Cisco OpenStack solutions and plugins to OpenStack products, like Cisco UCS and Nexus, which is nice because UCS and Nexus, they're data center staples. They're part of the FlexPod architecture, vBlock, and now we're bringing them into OpenStack environments. We've also done a lot of innovation around things that make OpenStack better with open source projects. Um, analytics and Virtualization, or AVOS, Ceph Early Warning System to detect before a Ceph pool fails, um, Smart Scheduling, a better Nova. We also do a lot of work with validation like CVD, Cisco Validated Designs. We take Cisco, Red Hat, and Intel products, we put them in a lab, we scale it up, and we validate it, and we stand behind the solution. We also do a lot of work with customers, helping them with best practices and for them to be successful with OpenStack. Work with several large customers, including Comcast, WebEx, PhotoBucket, um, some of the newer customers uh, with our partnerships of Red Hat and Intel, the Eli and Edith Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, or the Broad Institute. I mean, this is uh, geno genomics, gene sequencing. I mean, literally changing people's lives with OpenStack, Cisco, Red Hat, and Intel. And also FICO, one of the uh, user uh, uh, candidates today, also a good Cisco, Red Hat, and Intel OpenStack customer. We also have a rich ecosystem around NFEI featuring Red Hat and Intel. We've done a lot of investment in terms of other open source communities like Open Daylight and Open NFE. We've also contributed more than 40 applications to the open source community. And we've done a lot of work with validation. Um, we recently had a report from um, the European Advanced Networking Test Center, or ENTC. They put out phase one of their report earlier this year talking about how Cisco VPP vector packet processing along with Intel DPDK can get 10 gigabits per second with a single core. Phase two was released just prior to the OpenStack Summit, which talks a lot about Cisco's NFEI solution. 
So NFAI is kind of the best of both worlds. You have the flexibility of network function virtualization, yet it's embedded within the in infrastructure for a turnkey solution. We have Cisco UCS for compute and storage, as well as Red Hat as a Ceph uh, software overlay. Also with Cisco Nexus, um, a wide variety of um, networking controllers, APIC, OSC, Open Source Controller, or Open Daylight, VTS, Virtual Topology System for a nice VXLAN overlay. You know, a better, over, a better OpenStack, which is detailed in the NTech report, how it's easy to get started, easy to scale, high availability, very secure all with a single pane of glass for management and integrated infrastructure monitoring. We have a great go-to-market between Red Hat, Intel, and Cisco, all certified, a very high-performing solution. The entire solution is validated, all with a single support uh, point of contact within Cisco. So without further ado, let's get into it. To my left, we have Lou Tucker, our uh, Vice President and CTO. Um, Massive amount of experience, thinking machines, remember that scene from Jurassic Park, right? Sun, a little thing called Java, on the core team for that, Sun Cloud. I'm also to my far left, uh, Udi Elsner from, S from Intel, chief technologist in the SDN division, on the Open Daylight board, as well as technical steering committee, also in the IETF network service headers, or NSH co-editor. You'll also be at the IETF in Yokohama next week as well. Uh, to my right, Daryl Jordan Smith from Red Hat, or DGS, as you're known within Red Hat, runs a uh, vice president um, service provider sales. And on my far right, uh, JL Valente, extensive experience up and down the valley, including CEO and venture capitalist experience. So let's get into it. We'll ask the first tough question. We'll send this over to you, if you don't mind, because you're to my far right. Okay. So is NFE really ready for prime time? What are some of the biggest challenges facing adoption and rollout of NFV and SDN in the industry today? Well, it's a, a good question, but uh, yeah, just for those in the room, DJS is the short for my name, or, or people like to say Daryl Double Barrel. So uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd add that. But no, in terms of uh, is NFE real? Is it is it being deployed? Is it ready for prime time? I think we're beginning to see a number of the use cases out there that actually demonstrate that uh, NFE and OpenStack is ready for prime time. It's the reason why we've partnered extensively with uh, Cisco um, in order to provide the VNFs and the stability around the platform is necessary to make it a viable solution with all the sales and support uh, services from an operational perspective that allow you to deploy it within the network. I think some of the key things that we're seeing in terms of uh, uh, challenges uh, that we're working to collectively on upstream uh, around security. Uh, I think that's a big topic that we're going to be uh, continuing to develop. Uh, service chaining, I think uh, that's going to be another huge topic that we're going to bring together over the next 12 to 18 months. And you know, talking a little bit about the availability of uh, VNF and applications that sit in the cloud in terms of stateless and stateful applications. Uh, at Red Hat, we call them mode one and mode two applications. Mode one is really where you just virtualize an application. It just sits on a virtual machine. Um, mode two is really where you have a stateless application that actually is able to replicate itself or, or self-heal itself and migrate to, across the cloud in a, in, a, in a dynamic manner. So I think those are the, the interesting things from our perspective in terms of where we see things going and the acceleration of the marketplace. And coming back to your comment earlier about uh, uh, telcos, you, you would probably, uh, everyone in the room would understand that Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux is pretty well deployed in every telco in the, in, in the world. I mean, they've migrated a lot from Unix to, to, to Linux. And out of all of those customers uh, that we have today, there isn't one that I can't tell you that isn't looking at NFE, so I completely uh, uh, collaborate what you're saying there. Excellent. Anyone else care to comment? Is this one? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So um, I think we, we are making very good progress. Um, I guess uh, this panel is a good opportunity to talk about uh, multiple things that are happening in OpenStack, in standards, uh, other open source projects as well, and specifically also work that is uh, being sponsored, driven by uh, the three companies uh, involved. Now, um, on one hand, we, we are actually seeing not only trials, but uh, also some uh, deployment, which is good. But probably more interesting for you is, 
if I go and describe some of the things that uh, we as a community, and specifically in this event as OpenStack, uh, we still need to uh, focus on and, um, and, and work to make them better. So um, one statement, and, and there was uh, talking about uh, stage one and stage two uh, applications. Um, there is a difference between what people expect from a cloud management system when they think about cloud applications and when they think about telco applications. There, um, and I don't want to take too much time right now, I'll just mention a few and I guess there's going to be an opportunity with uh, the other questions to get into more details. But as an example, uh, people would like the, stay, the stack to be uh, carrier grade. Um, what that means is different for different people, but it clearly means that it's better than what we have today. Um, they uh, would like to have more network awareness. They are more sensitive to um, the right placement in order to achieve the right efficiency, in order to um, get higher infrastructure utilization, to lower the cost, to make the whole thing more feasible. Um, they would like to see more network awareness in the placement. We have made good progress in um, describing what is a modern server architecture to the orchestrator. We have work to do on, on the networking side, just to mention few, and I'll mention more as we go. I if yeah, I'd actually like to add that out as well. I think that in the last couple of years, we've seen the big shift take place in OpenStack, whereas OpenStack originally was modeled purely after essentially an Amazon in-house, uh, which is a very much a compute and storage centric view of it, of what is a cloud platform designed for, for web-based applications. Uh, when it seems like almost two years ago that the entire telco industry woke up and they realized they're spending too much money on, on fixed you know, machines that are out there of special purpose uh, hardware that have very long cycles and everything else like that have been hardened, have been made telco ready, carrier grade, but they just aren't keeping up um, with the changes in the industry. And so they're moving to software. They discovered they have data centers. They looked at, so how, what, what platform do they move to? They chose OpenStack. And so actually even from the foundation's point of view, we've had a working group on, on telco. We've had a, another working group on enterprise, which is sort of coming together because they both are trying to make now essentially a carrier grade platform that you can run these applications on. But I think the, the, the VNFs themselves are lagging behind. The, the virtualization of the network services, that's where all the work is going to be. So if we can harden the platform, we can make OpenStack, certainly make OpenStack to be a great platform for this. We're finding these services now exist above OpenStack. They, because they have to be orchestrated from there, and then they require interfaces below OpenStack into the hardware. So it's one of the, it's like a sandwich we're creating in which OpenStack is sort of you know, managing virtualized resources, but you need to have now communication between the top and the bottom, and that I think is, is the challenge that we're all facing. But everybody's certainly you know, very bullish. This is happening. No one's stopping this train. And so now I think the race is on to really do it in a way that we really are, can deliver the kind of services with the reliability, scalability, and everything else we'd expect from web apps. Yeah, and if I, uh, just to maybe close on this uh, topic and move on to the next question that you may have, is, uh, uh, yeah, it's real. The question was about NAV, you know, how much progress has been done, and we discussed it yesterday uh, with Red Hat as well, is, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, I can't disclose names of customers and what's happening. So um, on uh, overall, there are a number of organizations actually uh, from the different vendors that have already been um, out there and disclosed what they're doing, what they've done, not just in PUC, but also not just in, in trials, but also in deployments. On our side, from a Cisco standpoint, uh, Deutsche Telekom, Cloud VPN in uh, five or six countries, is something that is public, it's out there. Here in this country, SoftBank was actually published uh, a week ago, um, or two weeks ago, at the uh, um, Layer 1, 2, 3 event in Dusseldorf about um, you know, what they're pushing. In fact, it's inter interesting because many of those customers are also uh, evolving toward a, uh, uh, the NFVP. So they are doing physical and virtual. 
not just virtual, physical and virtual mix of a number of capabilities with different vendors, uh, whether it's A10 or uh, you know, Cisco uh, or uh, 14, 40 net, for example, and actually being able to migrate over time some of their assets to a virtual environment for enterprise services. Very unique. And on top of that, it's not just actually, and we'll discuss it, OpenStack, getting to OpenStack, many of them come from VMware. You got to be able to support that. So it's actually two modes to be able to get to OpenStack where they all want to be, but that's not where many of their infrastructure and environments and even knowledge operations are. So all of those elements here participate. There are many other customers. Some, many, uh, some of them have been obviously disclosed, uh, like Telecom Italia for us as well. So where you see actually this ramp up, not just in, uh, in production by the beginning of the year or in production already at this stage. One ahead, short sure. comment, uh, just to close on this, uh, maybe going back to loose comments. Uh, the layer above, uh, for those of you who follow uh, uh, the Etsy work, etc., is is the Mano layer. That that's a very big discussion right now in in the industry. And actually, we have uh, industry talk later this afternoon to um, start the community conversation here about. What is it that we need to do in OpenStack in order to allow this uh, other layer to be placed neatly on top of OpenStack? And I fully agree with the sandwich model too. So, Excellent point, thank you. So speaking of SDN World Congress, and Daryl, I believe you were in the house for that one in Dusseldorf. Absolutely, yes. So there was an interesting uh, report from British Telecom that came out which fundamentally said that they're considering dropping OpenStack for virtual enterprise services in favor of enterprise or proprietary technology unless OpenStack addressed six fundamental issues. And they were pretty basic. I mean, security, upgradability, manageability. What, what are the panel's thoughts on, on that report? I can give you, since you directed it originally at me, I mean, I know the individuals very well at British Telecom who made the report. I think, um, I think the, the press sens sensationalized a little bit about what they were really saying. I think that would be fair to say. I think what they were really saying is help us as the community make OpenStack carrier grade so we can deploy it in our business. And they mapped out six areas and uh, you know, we've, we're working, and I know Intel as well, and I'm sure that Cisco has uh, uh, areas where they're developing solutions in those areas, but those out of those six areas, five are pretty well defined in terms of blueprints and other things that we're developing upstream in conjunction actually with Cisco and, and, and Intel. Um, and there's one that, that, that we need to work on and listen to and actually try and address very specifically. And, and that was around security and some of the things that they're looking to, to try and strive there. So from our, from our perspective, from Red Hat's perspective, we saw it more as a call to action uh, from a very, uh, very important operator uh, with you know, very talented people who look at this every single day and work on it uh, very vigorously. And it's an area that we're very keen to, to improve. And I think. You know, a lot of the efforts you're going to see, as Lou was early intimating and Yuri was intimating, is a lot more focus around how do we make an OpenStack carry a grade or build those extra features upstream for everyone to benefit from uh, in terms of uh, uh, that sandwich that, uh, that, that we were also talking about. I think that's kind of interesting, too. I think we, um, when I talk to customers, they're always saying, um, well, they're afraid to get to the latest version of OpenStack because that's less stable and everything else. In a community development process, that's not true. The latest version is actually where all the fixes are made, where all of the security patches are made and everything else. Backporting those to the earlier releases is going to take a long time. So I think that we're going to start to see an inversion of the usual paradigm where we're, we're going to see a lot of companies now moving as aggressively as they can to get to the latest version because that's where all of the changes that we're talking about being made are right up at that at the head of trunk so that's going to be a change i think in, in terms of traditional software deployment so, um, yeah since uh, i was also in the room i fully agree with the over centralization that happened with with that that event and to talk about some of the other challenges that uh, peter mentioned in his uh, uh talk at uh, at that event um there are Things, for instance, one of the challenges he was talking about um, was the idea that when you uh, connect, disconnect, you have a NIC failure, you, you have multiple NICs on that machine, you don't know which one is actually going to be the one that you're using. Um, 
again, uh, all of this is community work, so I'm not going to uh, repeat that every time, but uh, there is work that is going on with all of you and all of us here um, about the more awareness of the data plane in terms of its capabilities and in terms of what's being used and in terms of what has been left. So, as Daryl pointed out, uh, these, these points are uh, already uh, been addressed and as Lou pointed out, yes, you go the latest, you, you get some of it. There are areas that for NFV are um, somewhat challenging as we take OpenStack to new areas and, and one of them is, for instance, in, in the context of, uh, of a CP, a customer premise equipment where um, what you have is the brain, some controller sitting someplace and it should have many tentacles out trying to reach all of those uh, tiny um, deployments in, in multiple places. This kind of model versus the model where everything happens in the data center is a little bit new. And the point that, that was cited by British Telecom in that case was, for instance, oh, really, I mean, each of them could potentially pick a different IP address. As they do this, I may have to punch individual holes in my firewall to en enable all of those. This is no different than uh, the work cut out that we have for ourselves in this community um, every day. Um, you have new use cases, good news, so we need to to add capabilities and we are all hard working at that. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, we got plenty of examples of those. So I'm uh, um, maybe contrarian here. I think there is a lot of work that uh, opens on OpenStack needs to be done uh, for that uh, standpoint. Uh, virtual CP, absolutely. In fact, today, uh, for most of virtual CP uh, environments, when you have 100,000 or a million, you're not gonna go OpenStack because of the, uh, the footprint, the complexity and the cost numbers doesn't make any sense, uh, overhead is too high, but also even uh, CMTS, cable, virtual CMTS. There are actually a number of cases today where um, we still have a lot of work to do in terms of the distribution of the control versus actually the, the compute areas and so on, so that actually we can take, uh, because it would be great if we can actually expand uh, and have a coverage from the, from the branch or from the CPE uh, all the way to the back end uh, data center. And uh, there is work absolutely in technically and also economically so that uh, you know, service providers can take it. Next generation pops, I mean, I can, uh, in Europe, there's one customer, 160 pops. You're not gonna get 160 uh, OpenStack masters uh, driving that, doesn't make any sense. So there is work that needs to be done. And it'll be interesting, maybe there'll be an update at Mobile World Congress. <clears throat> yeah, I think later this year. Yeah, I'm hoping that we'll somehow get together to formally answer Peter mm. and, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. publish a bit of a paper on that and, yeah. and, and try and move things forward. That's, that's our plan anyway. Good. Awesome. Um, so we mentioned VNF, virtual network function. So what VNFs are service providers looking to deploy first? We talked about uh, virtual CPE and we were talking about some others yesterday as well. But what are the VNFs, and are these just virtual instances of existing appliances they're deploying today? So again, I'll, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so from, from, from our perspective, I think that uh, the, a lot of the use cases that we're seeing at the moment around firewall in particular, mm -hmm. so that's a, that's a particular, and load balancing, I think those are two particularly interesting areas of particular VNFs, but from a perspective more of how do you auto-provision that across a very large scale environment? How do you take complexities out of provisioning that? Taking something that would take a typical operator 18 months and taking it down to you know, hours, eight hours or whatever the number, number is. So we're seeing some interesting applications around uh, virtual mobile VPN services um, with some of the larger operators. And uh, you know, we're beginning to see some of those actually go live in terms of trial next, ne next year. So speaking of the virtual network functions, like, so where are service providers looking to deploy them in the network first? Are these in the traditional POPs or distributed POPs or are VNFs kind of changing the paradigm where the functions are in the network? Go ahead, Yuri. I feel as I'm doing all the talking here. I'm very happy with the model. You go first. Very good. That's our pattern. So, um, so, from an, so from a VNF perspective, what we're seeing yeah, from our perspective is, is 
Uh, a lot of those are being, as I said earlier in, in, in the conversation, being standard appliance-based applications and services that happen to have been virtualized. So typically those are t typically deployed in a data center based environment versus on the edge as I think you were, uh, Jay was, was explaining earlier and the complexities associated with that. However, there are a number of operators that are looking at CPE models and, and trying to figure out how to address that and running into some of those challenges that we're trying to address. So from our perspective, they're typically mode one state uh, full applications that are sitting in the network. Typically, there are you know uh, they're gateways, they're IMS-based applications, they are uh, load balancing, um, firewall-based applications and services with some very interesting technologies around uh, provisioning and management and orchestration. Again, I think Yuri, you were you were talking about the the complexity and the need for that technology, and and certainly some of these standards bodies beginning now to look at that very seriously. Yeah. So, just, I, I, I've got a question. Yeah, so I've, got, I've got a question okay. for, the, for the, the true people who are true networking experts here. Um, in my view, we can't just take a VNF as it existed on a router or a switch, you know, a blade running in one of these, and plop it down on a VM in a, in a cloud and expect to get a decent performance. It's an opportunity for now for us to rethink those things. If, if you look at like large-scale distributed web applications, they're not designed at all the way you would have designed an enter enterprise vertically scaling app. They're designed scale out right from the start. I know that we're seeing inside of Neutron, for example, we're, we're doing a lot of things to look to see instead of, Neutron itself started with a network service node, right? One node, and then all the network traffic was gonna go through, all, all, the, all the tenant networks. And we know you can't scale that. And so then we're looking in the, in the Neutron community itself how to make that truly a distributed function across all of the nodes. That seems to be the direction that the, the cloud is going. Can we expect to see the same thing then with the, the VNFs themselves? Is so that your mode two? You know? Yes, my mode two. I, I think that's where we're going. Um, I think that people are just rushing to get you know, their environments virtualized first. Uh, I certainly think that these applications as they become mode two become more knowledgeable about what's happening around the application and certainly into the networking layer. I think that that's where we need to get to. There's a lot of work to, to drive that. Um, and then we get into, I think Uri was talking about, you know, what is carrier grade? You know, is it high availability of the application and services? Or is it, you know, hardware implementations that are highly available and completely robust? And, and I would like to feel that we can get to the stage mode two based applications where they live in, a, in the cloud in the true sense, that enable us to scale and drive that. And then I think, you know, coming back to your point earlier about, you know, people wanting to get to the latest version of OpenStack, the latest features are in OpenStack, you know, in the, in, in, you know, in the next release, certainly um, around real-time KVM, real-time Linux, right. Right. all to facilitate radio, you know, cloud-based radio accessing networks. So those more interesting cloud-based applications. And there there is, a, yeah, just uh, to that point, uh, and it goes back actually to the Mano piece, the, uh, the VNF manager, uh, if we look obviously on an FV uh, piece from a manual standpoint, the VNF manager touches actually directly with or interacts directly with actually the VM with OpenStack. Mm -hmm. And so the knowledge that you have to have at the VNF, even the, the descriptors, the payload, uh, the characteristics of that DNF, whether or not that VNF uh, is going to use uh, some specific advanced you know, CPU pinning or whatever capabilities that they need is going to have to be rendered at that level. And there is also, uh, for example, on the Cisco side, from a compute standpoint, we know that compute has to evolve to be able, right. we can't take generic compute to be able to run high performance and actually we've demonstrated that uh, so that actually you can take you know, thousands of uh, customers uh, enterprise customers or 100,000 subscribers, residential, because also it's going into the residential piece. Um, and, and that's where if you really want to run it, as we said earlier, about 16 or 2017, if you want really to scale up those actually environments, you're going to need actually to have those design environments from the, from the orchestration down to the compute areas. Yeah. So it's a game changer. Um, so a so, so few, few comments on, on these two, especially as compute evolution came up. But uh, going back to the, the two modes or two stages, uh, we could look at that from at least two different uh, aspects. One of them is simply, uh, you could even refer to this as social or, or simply the way new technologies progress in general. Uh, first, everybody, I mean, a very good analogy for that would be 
um, SDN, somebody wanted to suggest, oh, let's do open flow based switches. Everybody goes, do what? I'm already making uh, lots of money with what I have right now, too many changes. And so the mode one or the stage one really is where vendors are starting to say, yes, we actually believe, let us see what happens out there. Let us do uh, something really quick, more of our applications as they exist on, on a blade, um, and, and start moving to more softer model. Oh, that actually doesn't work quite all right, but I already have some customer interest. Then I'm moving to, to mode two, and now I'm really starting to really make it a little bit more stateless. Um, I still am not, I'm not done. I'm not done with scale, I'm not done with geography. Uh, many times um, uh, my application is really restricted to some, let's call it uh, one administrative domain, be it a data center or some other place where you have that. Oh, I don't actually have the ability to do one of the things that Mano, as an example, would re like you to do is, oh, we have an important sport event. I'd really like to scale up that capability and scale down another one, which in techno speak would mean, let me scale up uh, this VNF. How do you scale it up? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to add more compute on the resources that I have right now, or do you want to uh, go and fire up uh, new VM instances? Do you have the right descriptors that come from the top that say, what are the KPIs? What are the requirements under which I'm going to go fire up new VMs? Oh, the event is over. How do I scale back down? Um, you look at OpenStack today, mm, many cloud Amazon model as it started. Everything was way more static. So, so we need to do a few things. We need to start a have a way to standardize a little bit better on information models, descriptors, how we describe the service required, how we describe the infrastructure available and make the best match. That is the conversation later this afternoon. We need to do other things too. There was uh, the notion of compute evolution. That's where the data plane capabilities and performance become really instrumental in your ability to get the max out of the infrastructure you deploy. Not only that, you also want it to be flexible. Not only that, unlike the model we have today where you have VMs that are related to different applications, um, in the VNF, NFV model with the VNF as one of the building blocks, you have now few VMs that are actually related to each other. They are related to each other not only in terms of um, compute requirements, absolutely on the network side as well. You need to take that into account. But on any individual piece of equipment that you have out there, you may find some pretty IO slash network hungry uh, instances of something that potentially would be competing for resources. So we put that knowledge and capabilities into our platforms as well as educating the orchestrator that, hey, this platform has that, that platform has something different, how you take advantage of that. So, good point. Uh, quick question for Red Hat. So the user, <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> Walter, since, you, if, since we're going to be cutting this off in about five minutes, if you've got questions, yeah. please yeah, come please up to the mic. Please get them ready. So the, the user survey for this summit just came out, and NFV is the second most area of interest next to only containers, which everybody's talking about. So Red Hat's done a lot of innovation with Project Atomic for containers. Like, what's the conversation with service providers and containers? Well, a lot of service providers are looking at container technology for density um, predominantly, and they're looking for um, what applications they might move to containers and, and operate as a microservice. Uh, in a container within a platform as a service as an environment that sits on top of or in conjunction with uh, OpenStack. We don't see customers looking for one thing or another. We probably will see a hybrid. Uh, we see a lot of interest with technologies around Ceph 
you know, putting CEF, to, CEF into containers and, and managing uh, significant amounts of storage because the latest the, the SSDs and other technologies from a storage perspective that are coming have microprocessing actually built into the drive itself. So they become, they look almost like compute nodes that sit in, in the network within a container. So some interesting use cases around that. I think from a container perspective, uh, and this is my view, I think other people in, in Red Hat will have a different view. You know, they, they think it's already raring to go. Um, from my perspective, certainly, you know, there, there's a lot of work to be done around security with containers, uh, a lot of work with networking around containers. Um, I think we've, we, 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 it's an interesting topic that we want to invest a lot of time and money in, and that's why we've uh, uh, launched our uh, Atomic, which is our rel-based, uh, uh, container-based technology from, from Red Hat. And we're beginning to have some very interesting conversation with a lot of the operators, so we can actually talk to them about the world of virtual machines, we can talk to them about the world of cloud, we can talk to them about the world of containers and how those things might converge in the framework as a platform, as a service. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, we can take a few questions from the audience. It's not I've got a question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not for Red Hat, I hope. <laughs> no, no, not for Red Hat. No, in, in general is, when we're looking at NFV applications, I'm wondering where cloud computing has generally been there to be a platform serving multiple tenants. Multi-tenancy, we have a lot of different things that are going on. Networking is generally a part of the system infrastructure. It's not considered an application. And yet, are we applying sort of the wrong model there, thinking of it just as a tenant application? I, ideally, I would like to be able to think we could pull that off, but I question that because of the need for placement that you mentioned. We've done a lot of um, placement. Well, that's a very difficult problem. You have to know what else is going on on a node. Generally, in cloud computing, a tenant does not know what's happening on a physical host. We talk about network visibility. You want to be able to have that. So either we can start to abstract all of that and keep it secure so that multi -tenant, multiple tenants can't game each other and everything else, or we have to say, no, these are system administration apps. And these apps, therefore, are essentially owned by the service provider or whatever, and they have special privileges. And because that's something even in OpenStack we have to start taking a look at to be able to build that model in. So I'm just curious, do you think how far can we take this multi-tenant view or should we think of these things as being a different class of apps? You're, you must have an opinion. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask. I'll let you. I you mean, read okay, that CPU one. pinning. I mean, what, you know, a lot of these things. So I, I, I think we have uh, multiple things happening. Um, with uh, the question of uh, the role the network should play. Uh, sometimes in OpenStack, people used to refer to this, uh, are we turning the network into a first-class citizen yet or, or not? Um, so it, it, it appears to me that the real conversation um, starts with the way we model everything. Um, the way we understand what capabilities we have in whatever infrastructure you deploy. And if we simply stick to the NV example, I believe there is a need for more network awareness than what we have today. Whether it amounts to, it is also community driven, so it's not, it's not, um, many times what happens with community projects is in hindsight you see, oh, actually we, we did make the jump that you were alluding to, but uh, if you put it that way in front of the community on day one, it doesn't necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily happen that way. I think that what we'll see is um, features, and we are driving some of them, like the placement as an example, uh, where um, awareness also closed the loop back with Silometer. Uh, there is need for analytics to actually understand what, what your infrastructure is doing so you could get the best out of this. When we look back in a few years, I think we would be able to answer your question much clearer. JL, I'm wondering, because you're dealing with a lot of our customers, what is their view? Are they viewing this as these, this is part of their system infrastructure, or, or are they viewing this as an application they're running on their cloud? It depends who you talk to <laughs> in those organizations. Uh, to your point, uh, uh, placement even starts um, higher up. Um, you have to decide. For example, again, back to the central office or the POPs is based on, uh, let's say, a new customer coming in with different sites, 
where do you put actually the workloads dedicated to them, like you would do with mobile, for example, mobile enterprise. Um, and and in, to, taking into consideration the network aspect, plus obviously the availabilities, uh, the affinity rules or non-affinity. There are a number of things, the, uh, the data, uh, where the data needs to reside if you're a cross country like in Europe and so on. So, uh, all of those, so back to Yuri's point, model, the modeling from the bottom up to be able to expose and top down from the services have to be reconciled. And today, there's no good, uh, there's no good way. You got multiple ways, you got Tosk, you got different ways of people trying to, I was going to say Tosca, but yeah, there, there are multiple, between Yang, between Tosca, between other actually ways, even within OpenStack of rendering things, I think we still have a long way to go to make those systems actually cooperate. And that, that is actually because we are changing a model and we are going to more converged infrastructure. We actually have multiple industries who are looking at the same infrastructure and whether we like it or not, they come with different legacy. And so they have different information models, different application models in mind as well. And we are out of time to talk about containers. So. <laughs> we are unfortunately out of time. Um, just real quickly, you know, a lot of the things we're talking about today, they're in a demo in the Cisco booth downstairs. So please go to Marketplace and check it out. Also, you know, please contact your Cisco sales rep. I saw Brian walking around before, and you know, ask them how they can help you be successful with N NFV. And also, you have an invitation to contribute. A lot of these components, like Cloud Pulse and Alvos, they're on GitHub on Cisco DevNet with APIs. So please contribute. Tribute. And um, on behalf of Cisco and our good friends at Red Hat and Intel, we thank you so much for your interest and support for NFE, and we hope you enjoy the uh, rest of the summit here in Tokyo. Thank you. Thank you.